thank you. That's a very hard billing to live up to. But uh, I'll do my best. Uh, what I'll try to do is give you a bird's eye view because uh, as you've already pointed, seen through the case, it's quite a complicated, it's not as easy as it seems. So uh, without further ado, let's move on. I don't have any conflict of interest, but I would like to acknowledge a lot of people's work whose work have incorporated into this PowerPoint, including Dr. Arun Sami here today. Uh, I would also maybe like to start with a few questions. Uh, there are some key questions we should ask. What are the symptoms and types of withdrawal that we see? What complications can we expect reasonably? Who is at risk for severe withdrawal? And uh, lastly, how should withdrawal be evaluated and managed, which is the million dollar question. Coming to withdrawal symptoms itself, uh, forget about the DSM-5 uh, part, but you can see these are the various symptoms that we expect to see. There should be a cessation or reduction of heavy or prolonged alcohol use. Uh, that's particularly important, uh, especially because withdrawal can occur even when there is something that is called relative reduction of alcohol use occurs. Uh, the, during this time, this, that's why, for example, people may have withdrawal seizures even if they reduce the amount of alcohol that they do drink. Uh, they need to be, a, they, these are some of the symptoms that we see usually. Autonomic hyperactivity, which is increased heart rate, blood pressure, sweating, which we saw in the case that we just discussed. Tremors, insomnia, vomiting. There can be transient visual, tactile or auditory hallucinations or illusions. And psychomotor agitation, anxiety, and of course, seizures. So let's try and look at a little bit about the timeline of withdrawal. Now we know that withdrawal starts around six hours after the last drink. It may start earlier, even up to two hours after the last drink, for example, in very heavy users. So this may vary from minor symptoms. I think the size are a little bit small, but you can see that anxiety, insomnia, gastrointestinal upset, including nausea, vomiting, headache, palpitations, and of course, anorexia, which is what we would see in simple withdrawal. Or the withdrawal that isn't that doesn't worry us too much as of yet. We all could also have alcohol hallucinosis, which are basically hallucinations in any modality. And uh, these may occur usually within the first 48 hours or so, but they may extend for longer than that in certain patients. Coming to the big two are the ones which we're really worried about. This is withdrawal seizures and of course, delirium tremens. Withdrawal seizures tend to be generalized and they're tonic-clonic conventions. Now, it's important to remember that though this timeline shows them as occurring in basically between the first and the second day, they may actually occur even up to six to six hours after last drink. So they may occur earlier than we expect. Delirium tremens itself, it occurs around 48 to 72 hours after the last drink. However, it may occur earlier and of course it may occur later, which is in say maybe a week or so after um, last drink. In that case, we need to be extremely careful about whether we're actually dealing with the delirium which is related to alcohol withdrawal or another type of delirium entirely. Uh, before we go for, forward, uh, since it's not in slides, one of the key features of delirium that we would be most interested in diagnosing would be the person's responsiveness to the environment and themselves. For example, somebody with who is disoriented may not necessarily be in delirium and disorientation also tends to occur in other disorders such as dementia as well. So the key hallmark of delirium is an inability or a difficulty responding to the environment around themselves or to internal bodily skews such as the need to void uh, bowel or bladder. Now um, how does this present? You'll find that people need to be either spoken to in a very loud tone of voice, louder than usual. They may need additional cues to draw their attention, such as touching them, repeating questions over and over, or they may have a hyperactivity to the environment in which small noises, small cues make, have a disproportionate response. Anyway, in most cases, delirium, this is the key feature of delirium. In addition, you have disruption in the sleep-wake cycle, which is basically where sleeping hours tend to get shifted from the normal. There may be increased emotional responsiveness, which is again disproportionate to situations. There may be confusion along with certain uh, delusions, hallucinations, which are a part of this uh, syndrome. And of course, there's a change in psychomotor activity, 
which is essentially either people are much more uh, active in particular situations which is not really in keeping with the situation or they may be less active so with that introduction uh, it's important to remember that breath, uh, blood alcohol changes tend to be around 0.02 mg per deciliter per drink per hour this is why even if somebody reduces their alcohol intake they may still go into withdrawal the key then is to actually intervene as early as possible we want to really intervene when the symptoms are minor and not so much when the symptoms are more severe so let's come to seizures which is one of the complicated withdrawals that we were talking about now seizures are generally characterized by tonic clonic seizures uh, they may be partial seizures as well but these are not typical these may occur in patients who have absolutely no history of seizure seizure disorder in uh, the past and with completely normal eegs however there's a corollary if somebody does have a history of seizure disorder then their chances of having a seizure are more likely this is a break up of what you'll see and you'll see around 60% actually present with multiple seizures which vary between 3 to 6 times of or rather 2 to 6 times by which they have a seizure so that's the most common way that they present not so much in single seizures around 3% of those who have a withdrawal seizure could actually go into status epilepticus and 30% of them could progress to dd so this is where it becomes important when you do have somebody with a withdrawal seizure it's important to understand that they may actually go into delirium tremens and around 30% of them will coming to what we should think about as well of course we should need to rule out other drug use for example people may be using benzodiazepines or they may have used an opioid and may have had a overdose uh with opioids so it's important to rule out other drugs it's important to rule out an underlying seizure disorder or whether somebody has just stopped taking their anti epileptic medications which does happen when people tend to relapse there may also be other drugs which are used for example we may be watching a we may be dealing with somebody who has had a recent suicide attempt such as organophosphorus intake of organophosphorus compounds in addition they may have they may be on att and inh can be another drug that actually causes this kind of withdrawal seizure i mean rather seizures etc metabolic disorders such as hypoglycemia hyponatremia hypernatremia should also be there and hypocalcemia can also present with seizures and lastly infections trauma and stroke last but not least are three of the most important things we're trying to rule out when we see somebody with seizures coming on to delirium so in terms of delirium it occurs in around 5% of patients it may be triggered by infection illness or head injury this is important to note especially because delirium is usually multifactorial and so therefore treating just alcohol withdrawal may not help in cases where other factors are triggering delirium or worsening delirium uh, there is around without treatment there is around 20 to 50% mortality and with treatment it varies between 5 and 10% earlier uh, research showed around 10% more recent research puts it at around 5 what are the three types of delirium that we are likely to see there could be a hyperactive delirium where a person is agitated disoriented and may be experiencing active hallucinations uh, this is a case where we would be wondering whether the person is suffering from an acute uh, episode of schizophrenia may, may be agitated dementia or even a psychotic disorder another type of delirium that we might see is something that is called the hypoactive type where the client is not so much agitated but subdued confused disoriented and not really interacting with the environment uh, the danger with this delirium is that it may actually go unrecognized simply because pe- the person is not actually causing any uh, disturbance unlike in the first type of delirium uh, one of the dds that would come to mind would be depression or dementia and of course there can be a mix of type of delirium characteristically where persons have periods of being less active and hyperactive here again mixed types tend to be more mixed types of deliriums in terms of etiology as well uh, what you should take away from this slide is this if you see hypoactive delirium or a mixed type of delirium then we really need to investigate because the chances of it being solely alcohol um, withdrawal delirium are likely to be less it's likely to be a multifactorial delirium okay uh, this is a very morbid mnemonic i watched it but these are the other differential diagnosis that we could consider when we are looking at somebody with delirium why are we talking about this as we said delirium tends to be a multifactorial condition and if 
thus we need to be aware of what are the, all the other causes that we need to be reasonably sure to rule out they vary from infections uh, to withdrawals from other drugs acute metabolic problems which could be precipitated by alcohol benzodiazepines and uh, sorry i think that's a, a typographic error the metabolic causes basically in terms of other metabolic syndromes that could present uh, toxins and drugs um cns pathology such as strokes tumors seizures hypoxia um it's important to remember that severe anemia and this client that we discussed also had it can be something that actually worsens delirium and also uh, remember that in delirium there is a heightened autonomic activity this can actually precipitate pulmonary or cardiac failure in somebody who already has anemia vitamin deficiencies endocrine disorders uh, that's another interesting one because endocrine disorders can actually worsen cognitive functioning and it can be something that uh, interferes with our ability to decide what the etiology of the uh, confusion state is of course acute vascular pathology trauma and heavy metal poisonings are other things that we need to consider why heavy metals well when you have brewed alcohol or uh, uh, locally made alcohol this is where heavy metal poisonings tend to be seen a little bit more especially lead poisoning and so that's something that we need to keep in mind when we're dealing with lo- people who use locally made alcohols so to sum up these are the severe symptoms that we are likely to see we are likely to see somebody who has agitation they could they need or need not be fever they could be convulsions and of course they could be a confusional states however if you uh, if you look at the right of your screen you'll see that people could have injuries either prior to the onset of the uh, particular uh, del- delirium or even after for example in the previous case we saw somebody who had a subdural hematoma which was in the healed in the past people could also fall after being in delirium and therefore suffer a head injury then on there could be electrolyte imbalances especially because oral intake is disturbed and lastly of course wernicke syndrome is something that we need to consider in addition we need to look at all of these other risk factors very important is something is aspiration and it's important to try and avoid aspiration when somebody comes into the uh, emergency setting in delirium because that could be something that really worsens the picture later on and it's important to try and take steps early to Uh, prevent it in addition we need to look at respiratory disturbances sepsis wet sores uh, un, uh, basically un, unknown sources of infection and of course the possibility exists that somebody may run away from the ward while in a agitated state uh we won't spend too much time on this slide it's be, these are basically some of the neurotransmitters that are affected by alcohol we can see that dopamine noradrenaline opioids gaba glutamate and serotonin are affected in a sense withdrawal is caused by a imbalance between these the between the activity of these various um, neurotransmitters simply because while alcohol includes uh, increases the some of their levels it interferes with some of their levels and when alcohol is stopped uh, suddenly uh, reduced to some extent there is an imbalance in the current neurotransmitter functioning this is an interesting phenomenon it's uh, something that's called kindling now there were two theories that were proposed to look at why people have withdrawal seizures one was called priming which is where somebody being repo- exposed to alcohol repeatedly over time was supposed to sensitize the person to the effects of alcohol kindling is a procedure where uh, basically when somebody had repeated episodes of withdrawal uh, their uh, tendency was to have more severe withdrawal over time there are some animal models that point to this etiology especially in mice so what is kindling essentially essentially it's a weak electrical or chemical stimulus initially there's no overt behavioral response but over time there is the appearance of behavioral effects such as seizures and especially it's important to note that this stimulus needs to be applied repeatedly uh recent literature at least in terms of meta analysis hasn't shown too much of a uh, uh support for this theory but these are some of the theories as to why people have worse episodes of withdrawal over time this is a very busy slide which uh, looks at a lot of the imbalances that actually cause um uh, this susceptibility to seizures i want you to just take a look at the uh, the uh, the right of the screen where you'll see that it's not just increased seizure susceptibility it's also anxiety there's neurotoxicity because of disturbed calcium intracellular calcium metabolism and of course there is an altered subject to perception and that is what leads to uh, delirium and this uh, because of these uh, repeated episodes of withdrawal people may actually be uh, continue to drink or relapse more often 
So what are some of the factors? That's the second question. That's not maybe not the second, but that's one of the questions we ask. Who is more likely to have severe withdrawal? So the time since last use, of course, use of other substances along with alcohol, a past history of complicated withdrawal syndromes, heavy use of alcohol, medical illnesses, uh, recent surgeries, and of course, older age. But it doesn't quite stop there. Um, we've also already talked about history of, history of complicated withdrawal, including delirium, but elevated liver enzymes, a high blood alcohol at the start of withdrawal, and a longer duration of alcohol misuse uh, or abuse. Basically, around 75% with six years of use tend to have withdrawal, severe withdrawals. And lastly, of course, alcohol associated gastrointestinal illness tends to make the chances of having a severe withdrawal more likely. Uh, this is something that we need to keep in mind because a lot of people present with uh, nausea, vomiting, or other uh, gastrointestinal disturbances. And it's actually a risk factor for severe withdrawal. What are some of the robust predictors of delirium? Somebody with a pre existing cognitive impairment is more likely to have delirium. Any CNS disorder, more likely to have delirium. Uh, extremes of age are more susceptible to delirium. Low serum albumin is one thing that predisposes somebody to delirium. And exposure to other medications such as anticholinergics or salicylates or opiates could are some things that robustly predict somebody who's likely to go into delirium. Fine, let's go on from there. So, these are the two major syndromes that we've talked about. So what are the objectives of treatment? They are to relieve the patient's discomfort, to prevent the occurrence of more severe symptoms as we're intervening early, postal any cumulative effects that may worsen future withdrawal, and lastly, use the opportunity to engage patients despite that being oftentimes a very difficult thing to do. Uh, in terms of simple withdrawal, what we talked about initially, uh, it can actually, simple withdrawal may be actually be well be able to be managed at home. In some cases, it may need no substitution, though most cases will need some degree of substitution. Moderate alcohol withdrawal would need substitution and inpatient stay would be advised in certain clients, whereas severe alcohol withdrawal would need substitution and inpatient stay most of the time. All of the time, actually. So, just carrying on from that point. So, the majority could be treated in outpatient because the majority that we would have simple withdrawal. However, if somebody had severe withdrawal symptoms, was confused or delirious, had a medical or surgical illness, which is concurrent, psychiatric symptoms, which are uh, concurrent, pregnancy, suicidality, significant craving, and a poor support network, and a past history of failed uh, treatments at home, would be people who would benefit from inpatient care. What's the management that we are thinking of? It needs to be multidisciplinary, needs to be comprehensive, and we need to involve the family. We'll take a look at how that happens over time. So let's go to a step-by-step -step diagnostic approach. Again, a very busy slide, but uh, let's focus on the main points. In history, it's important to look at previous cognitive status. Please keep in mind that I'm not taking you through the entire process of evaluating substance use, but I'm trying to take a look at what are the major risk factors for withdrawal. So previous cognitive status, trying to establish a base baseline cognitive and functional status before the onset of symptoms. This, of course, can be quite difficult to do, but it's important to try. And one thing that can help is multiple sources of information. Uh, medication usage. It's important to look at other medications that are used, used including herbal remedies, non-prescription medications, and illicit substances. In cases where we're not sure, uh, a polycate or a urine polycate can be used to rule out use of other drugs. Comorbid conditions, especially neurological diseases such as uh, cerebral vascular accidents, Parkinson's disease, cardiovascular illnesses, myocardial infarction, angina can present with delirium, and of course, uh, renal or metabolic diseases. Please remember that somebody can actually go into delirium because of alcohol withdrawal, but may have an MI later because of the worsened autonomic function that is occurring. So it's important to keep these in mind when we're evaluating anybody with delirium. Alcohol and drug use, it's important to, of course, to look at the alcohol history and try and look at intoxication and withdrawal, look at past episodes of withdrawal. Recent binge drinking can cause alcoholic ketoacidosis, uh, much like a starvation-like syndrome. And, uh, of course, Wernicke Kosakoff's syndrome could also occur. Uh, what's on your screen is a standard drink. We'll take a look at it a little bit later, but you can see around one unit of alcohol is around uh, 30 ml of spirits which transmits to around 100 ml of table wine, that's 12.5%, and of course varies with beers based on their strength. 
standard ring sizes well in india of course standard ring sizes tends to uh, vary a little bit based on how much we pour and uh, where we're pouring it uh, and of course uh, what type of liquor we're drinking so who also <laughs> yeah who's who's pouring it so uh, that's something we need to keep in mind what what you should carry away what should you carry away from this slide <laughs> keep in mind that when somebody reports to you that ring sizes it may not be accurate in terms of units of alcohol so what does this mean for us in terms of uh, planning doses of benzodiazepines when we really can't plan doses of benzodiazepines solely based on alcohol use or in terms of units of alcohol we need to tailor it based on the client's clinical condition so take home message from this slide uh, take drink sizes with a little bit of a pinch of salt and based on where you are adjust your calculations uh, accordingly it's important to look at some other factors pain levels can actually make delirium worse why are we talking about this uh, somebody may actually have fallen down during their episode of delirium and may have suffered a fracture if that isn't detected pain is going to increase and delirium is likely to be much more severe and agitation is likely to be severe so what does this mean for us we need to look at uh, we need to do a good physical examination and rule out other injuries when we are dealing with delirium of course environmental factors such as sleep deprivation extremely bright lit rooms uh, yeah, when a person usually uses a hearing aid their responsiveness in delirium may be even further affected and use of restraints can be something that worsens delirium certain tools such as the confusion assessment method and uh, the intensive care delirium screening checklist can be useful though they're not used very commonly uh, in the indian setting some of the investigations that can be done please note uh that you do not need to do all of these investigations or in fact to treating delirium you don't need to necessarily suppose you don't have these at your center uh, a clinical examination is very important as part of the assessment investigations add on to that so total blood count looks at the presence of infection or anemia uh, metabolic disturbances and hepatic encephalopathy can be ruled out with biochemical analysis uh, urinary infections tend to be unrecognized and unnoticed and this can urine analysis can help that lastly chest x ray can rule out pneumonia congestive heart failure or even unrecognized tb which is a common condition in india especially with people who have substance use uh, other drug levels digox for example a person who is on digoxin lithium or quinidine would be important to note and ecg is a must for any delirium primarily because the most the largest cause of mortality and that's something we didn't discuss earlier is the largest cause of mortality in delirium tends to be cardiovascular so it's important to do an ecg for all delirium patients that's something that is an absolute must arterial blood gases if you have the capability when you suspect hypoxia hypercapnia or lactate especially when the client is in sepsis if no etiology is identified other investigations might be needed uh, this could be neurological imaging cts or mris lumbar puncture when we suspect meningitis meningitis or encephalitis eegs and of course sputum blood culture abdominal ultrasound d dimer thyroid function tests uh, uh, tests for vdrl and for hiv because and of course ammonia were indicated so again please let me repeat you don't need to do all of these tests for everybody but these are some of the tests that can aid in diagnosis some things that you need to look at in physical examination particularly pupillary light reflexes uh, plantar reflexes fundus these are important signs because they point to various neurological uh, uh, causes of uh, delirium uh, uh, they can also be a look for any focuses of infection or injury signs of dehydration nutritional deficiencies and of course liver cell failure another thing that we aren't going to be discussing today is that some people may actually have pellagra along with uh, vanicke kosakoff syndrome and uh, the good thing about using optinurin is that it also contains uh, niacin replacement as well but that's something that we need to keep in mind some of the things that we need to be wary of if delirium is occurring very quickly after stopping alcohol or if delirium is occurring very late say 6 to 7 days after use it's important to look at other causes of delirium uh before we medicated somebody having them be in hypoactive delirium is a concern if your pulse rate is less than 100 despite the person supposedly having to be in withdrawal and of course pair pair this with a high blood pressure then you need to rule out head injury seriously 
We also need to rule out other cardiovascular uh, uh, illnesses. Presence of rigidity, fever, ataxia, diplopia, and of course, an elaborate systematized psychotic symptoms, which isn't really characteristic of delirium. Also, high val values in liver function tests, but this also has a uh, thing. For example, suppose bilirubin tends to be high, but AST, ALT is low. That's also a concern because that actually points to a more severe form of liver damage. Some of the scales, scales that are used, uh, the SIVA AR, the SIVA A, and the short alcohol withdrawal scales. Basically, the Clinical Institute Withdrawal Assessment. Uh, this is the SIVA. It, you, it can be used to divide withdrawal into mild, moderate, and severe. This can aid in actually planning treatment, especially in symptom-triggered regimens, or in fact, in OPD assessments. If you look at some of the items, they're very small here, but they basically point to all of those symptoms that we talked about before, including autonomic hyperactivity, tremors, withdrawals, and so on and so forth. So we need to look at care at three levels. One is prevention. Treat adequate withdrawals adequate and early. Try and get the person not to go into DT. So look for risk factors of DT. We've discussed this already, but these are some of them. Try and ensure adequate hydration or nutrition. Consider an immune tubernicase and all and treat appropriately. Aspiration prevention care. This can occur when, for example, when somebody is sedated or somebody is in hyperactive delirium. Aspiration may occur early on. And so it's important to start the, start telling family members and clients if they're cooperative enough how to prevent or avoid aspirations. Uh, monitoring vitals, monitoring input and output, other chronic medical illnesses, and getting the patient into early mobilization and re reorienting reorienting him quickly. Family members can be a group of uh, caregivers who, are, who can actually help with this uh, reorientation. It's important to manage the environment to ensure that it's quiet, that there are no unnecessary objects which can be used to either hurt themselves or other people, minimizing outside noises and stimuli in general. Mechanical restraints, if needed, must be applied for as short as possible and there needs to be close monitoring. What is the treatment of choice? Uh, the treatment choice is benzodiazepines overwhelmingly. And uh, this uh, you know, is compared to placebo as well as other as well as other medications that are used. In terms of meta-analyses, all benzodiazepines have similar efficacy and uh, both long and medium acting. However, some literature points to uh, longer acting uh, benzodiazepines being better at preventing withdrawals and seizures. Of course, there are some, uh, some uh, indications that say lorazepam may be better at preventing a uh, seizure immediately. This is primarily because though uh, diazepam uh, has a wide area of distribution, lorazepam does not. And so therefore, it stays in the extravascular compartment longer than diazepam would. Uh, so anyway, whichever diazepam you, benzodiazepine you start, you need to start it early. And going by the SIVA AR score may actually help rather than waiting for more severe withdrawal symptoms to occur. It's important to use an adequate dose of benzodiazepines. And when you give these doses of benzodiazepine, even in terms of higher doses, such as we talked about even 150, 200, for example, it is safe when close monitoring is done. I, as we discussed, long-acting benzodiazepines may be more effective in preventing seizures and delirium. The benefits must be weighed against the risk, in, as particularly in those who are elderly and those with liver damage. Oxazepam and lorazepam may be used in liver da damage. Temazepam is available, but it isn't used too much. In elderly and in people with cognitive disorders as well, short-acting benzodiazepines may help uh, determine what, uh, what is going on more easily than, say, giving a long-acting benzodiazepine. Some other drugs that have been used, baclofen has been, uh, when a uh, meta-analysis looked at baclofen, it looked at two RCTs. And one actually showed that uh, baclofen was better than placebo. The other one showed that baclofen was not so much better than placebo. But uh, what it did was it, it did help in reducing the total amount of diazepam that was used in that uh, trial. Still, the uh, evidence is inconclusive and more work needs to be done. Totally, both meta-analyses come, come up to around 81 patients. Carbazepine, uh, when seizures are present, has been something that has been noted to have a, uh, a salutary effect on preventing with, uh, withdrawal seizures. Now, the dose of carbazepine, uh, tapering doses have been used, basically starting at 800 mg, up to 800 mg on the first day, and going down by around 200 mg per day, so that by day 7, carbazepine is completely stopped. Uh, however, 
benzodiazepines are far better at reducing delirium and overall mortality than carbazepine in addition carbazepine may confuse the uh, picture when somebody presents with ataxia acamprosate acamprosate was initially discovered because of its uh, uh, tendency to help in withdrawal however evidence is uh, really inconclusive as to whether adding it at the beginning helps or not some literature points the fact that it helps some does it but uh, for example the nice guidelines state that acamprosate should be started as soon as uh, your uh, initial detoxification is over there are other agents that have been used clonimethazole gabapentin clonidine in patches as well but uh, the evidence for these again their comparison to back, uh, to benzodiazepines benzodiazepines overall seem to be much better than uh, them in preventing seizures and in terms of handling delirium and so therefore out of all of these there is insufficient evidence to recommend these as first line treatments so therefore since we established benzodiazepine as a drug of choice we need to understand that inadequate treatment might result in delirium worsening over the next 24 hours so how do we determine adequacy of dose so there are three treatment regimens that are used one is the fixed dose the other is front loading and of course there is a symptom trigger regimen now what is the ips guidelines for example say about using of these regimens fixed dose regimens are actually recommended for routine use with symptom trigger dosing reserved for use only with those with adequate monitoring this is largely due to a practical practical uh, reality but uh, symptom triggered regimens tend to be the best regimens overall of course they are resource intensive regimens fixed dose basically they are predetermined intervals and doses of benzodiazepines determined by assessing severity of dependence they may result in either under or over treatment they tend also tend to have slightly longer durations of treatment because of uh, they are not really based on symptoms and they are often used in outpatient settings for mild to moderate withdrawal this is one example of a fixed dose regimen here you can see that chlorodiazepoxide is being given four times a day but of course please remember that maybe actually even three day times a day or less simply because it's a long acting uh, agent you can see here the one thing is that fixed dose regimens aren't really recommended to continue beyond 7 days highly recommended to uh, finish your uh, tapering within a week however this may not apply to all patients and certain clients may have withdrawal symptoms which are more severe or which last longer this is for example a similar uh, thing of chlorodiazepoxide for more severe withdrawal you can see here that the dose is much more higher than in the previous slide you can see also here that the number of days of uh, tapering are also longer so essentially these are some of the two of the regimens that we can think of for chlorodiazepoxide for fixed dose regimens symptom triggered regimens they tend to be either present in inpatient or residential settings they need trained staff for monitoring and dose is dependent on severity of withdrawal symptoms so at but particular intervals 2 to 3 hours for example medication may be given only when withdrawal symptoms are observed usually assessments are based on the siva air or sweating tremors pulse bp temperature and level of consciousness are the major uh, factors which determine this okay very busy slide this is supposed to actually show you the difference between say a uh, diazepam chlorodiazepoxide and lorazepam in both the fixed dose and the symptom trigger essentially what it comes to is that uh, fixed doses tend to be last longer and in terms of when you give short acting agents you need to give them more often and more times a day than when you give long acting agents uh, this is the equivalence of one unit of alcohol you can see uh, this is taken from goodman and gilman however this tends to vary widely and uh, captain sadok i think gives it slightly differently but around 5 mg of diazepam is equal to around uh, 10 to 25 mg of chlorodiazepoxide 0.5 mg of clonazepam and lorazepam around 1 mg oxazepam say 30 mg some uh, reports point to around 15 mg of oxazepam be equal to diazepam 5 mg so what does this mean for us again it means that we really need to go by clinical assessment rather than solely by the amount that a person is drinking it may not be uh, it's important to warn people when they are given high doses of benzodiazepines about the effects that can occur for example needing help going to the bathroom or uh, the possibility of falls not needing to use heavy equipment or to drive as these are uh, risky when the person is on a fixed dose regimen why is this important well basically one unit of alcohol is supposed to be equal to one standard drink and that's where our previous uh, as it comes in over here so when we know how much the person is drinking we are able to calculate 
how much benzodiazepines the person might need. However, sometimes this is, uh, you might find that a person is drinking 24 units of alcohol and therefore you reasonably need to give him um, around uh, uh, 120 mg of diazepam as a fixed dose regimen. So what does that mean for us again? Basically, when we do, we, it's important to try and understand and analyze how much a person is drinking. We need to look at the clinical picture and then decide about uh, uh, how much we're going to give. In a fixed dose regimen, it's important to try and call the person for follow-up as quickly as possible because uh, at least on an OPD basis, some degree of monitoring is essential. Getting a family member to look for certain danger signs, such as early signs of withdrawal or delirium, are important to uh, uh, state to family members. The front loading regimen uh, tends to vary, but around initial dose of long-acting diazepam, repeating every one hour to one and a half hours until light sedation or a maximum dose of 100 mg is reached. And once it's achieved, to withhold. This is contraindicated in head injury, advanced liver disease or COPD, and it must be used with caution in the elderly. This regimen has the advantage of not, not having to give any amount of diazepam after this initial front-loading uh, regimen, simply because diazepam is a long-acting agent and metabolites tend to handle the, uh, uh, the period of withdrawal better. However, this may not be the best regimen for, not sorry, this isn't the best regimen for those with either withdrawal seizures or with uh, delirium, because in them, withdrawal symptoms may last longer. Yeah, we'll, uh, this, is, this regimen is something that we actually follow in Nivan simply because it's sometimes very difficult to adhere to a single approach. Um, we tend to follow a kind of a hybrid version of the, of the two. Yeah. So it's essentially what we do is that we follow the front loading regimen, but subsequently we look at withdrawal symptoms over the next few days and we continue to give benzodiazepines when required. For some, after the first day itself, we may then go to a fixed dose and taper it. For others, we might observe over time and then give accordingly. It's important that for this again, remember that monitoring is important. It's important to look for restlessness, anxiety, uh, palpitations, mood changes, sweating, inability to sleep or inability to relax, as well as look at concomitant physical signs and psychiatric symptoms. So we try and look at getting a CYR scoring below 8 or a pulse rate below 100 and the patient being calm. It could be used with either diazepam or lorazepam. Well, please remember that lorazepam needs to be dosed more often than diazepam. So coming to the next day, so what something again that we do, we can split them into three to four doses over the day and administer and follow a graded dose tapering schedule. In certain cases, we would look at their uh, symptomatology and then decide the second day's doses based on that. This would especially be important if somebody, for example, is having a, is ex extremely drowsy after the first day. You would not then give the same dose as you did the first day. You would look at uh, the person's symptoms look at physical signs and then decide how much diazepam or lorazepam you would plan to give. In certain cases, haloperidol may be used if symptom is, aggression is high, but this must be used with caution, especially because any antipsychotic may increase the threshold for having seizures. So this must be uh, used keeping in mind that risk and uh, it should be used when agitation is unable to be controlled with an adequate dose of benzodiazepine. After we, uh, after we handle withdrawal, it's important to actually look at educating and telling patients and their families what actually is occurring. It's important to talk to them about what the underlying causes are and what symptoms they need to be looking for. This would help them actually uh, realize when things are going wrong before they actually do. It's also important to try and look at giving the patient a full understanding, preventing shame, guilt with this and helping them get back into their original environment. This is easier said than done, but it's important to try and look at these as some of our goals. It's, uh, it's important to try and use this opportunity to try and engage the patient into a long-term treatment, especially because we know that just handling withdrawal isn't the totality of treatment. Lastly, I think last two slides, uh, last two or three slides, I won't go into this in too much detail, but the classic triad of Wernicke Koskoff's uh, confusion, ataxia, and uh, and uh, of course, uh, ophthalmoplegia may not be seen in all of the all of the uh, clients. So, what does this mean for us? If there is evidence of ophthalmoplegia, ataxia, confusion, memory disturbance, 
unexplained hypertension, hypothermia, coma, unconsciousness, it's important to suspect Wernicke Koskov syndrome. Please note this because it's very important. Uh, we do not need all three. All three occur in something like 16% of clients. The most specific is ophthalmoplegia, but it tends to get resolved very quickly. And so it isn't really uh, noted. But these are the five, four, five or six signs that we need to see. And when we do see them, we need to look, we need to treat it aggressively. Um, the, these are what the IPS guidelines say that somebody at risk for one case cost costs should be treated with 100 mg of intramuscular oral tiny before any glucose intake. In an Indian setting, suspected the high risk cases of 1EK cost cuffs, thymine needs to be given for a fortnight, along with oral preparation of at least 100 to 200 mg of thymine. The British National Formulary Guidelines are a little bit different. They say that healthy, uncomplicated, alcohol dependent, uh, heavy drinkers need to be given around 300 mg per, per day of oral thymine. Uh, in terms of a therapeutic dose for thymine, they give around 1500 mg per day or two pairs of ampules of high potency vitamin D. It also includes ascorbic acid, folic acid as well. And they give these for five days or as long as if we two, two days initially. If there's a response, they continue for another five days. If for two days there's no improvement, they tend to relook at whether uh, the cause of this uh, these symptoms are another underlying syndrome. For prophylaxis, this is people at high risk. The four or five conditions we discussed in the previous slide. Uh, it would be around 250 mg of thymine once a day, apparently, for at least five days and subsequently orally. Lastly, something we don't often see, but something we need, could occur, methanol toxicity. It's usually characterized, characterized by visual disturbances and abdominal pain. In certain cases, you'd see neurological abnormalities, small breathing and impaired cardiac function and hypertension. It occurs in around 37 to 72% of patients will have both visual disturbances and abdominal pain. Uh, we'll skip this. Basically, what can we do? Unfortunately, not too much in a psychiatric setup. So what we need to do is try and induce immediate gastric lavage or emesis or use of activated charcoal within 30 to 60 minutes after ingestion of alcohol. Uh, Fomipazole is not available in India. Ethanol could be administered. It isn't FDA approved, but it's been something that's been used not just for methanol poisoning, but also for ethylene glycol poisoning. And of course, dialysis is important if none of these are available. So it's important to try and look at a multi-speciality setting or a setting where such facilities are available if somebody is having methanol poisoning. To summarize, it's important to assess carefully, individualized treatment, simple withdrawal may be required, just OP based treatment, but complicated withdrawal may require, usually will require IP treatment. Benzodiazepines are the treatment of choice, fixed dose may be used for OP setting, but symptom triggered is better, though it's more resource intensive. Prod clotting is another um, uh, modality that can be used. It's important to watch for vitamin deficiencies, especially K cause of syndrome, and delirium is likely to be multifactorial. Please rule out other comorbidities before uh, uh, saying that just alcohol is the cause of it. So uh, these are some of my references and thank you. And if we have time for questions, I think we have about five minutes. Or so. yeah, five more minutes. Any questions from in-house? Yeah, we, you can send questions by chat or you can ask. Directly. I think uh, Dr. Sarunda. Give me the role of metadoxyl in the delirium or any withdrawal. Uh, there's been some, uh, there's, there's been studies about use of metadoxyl not just in withdrawal but in craving as well. Um, it's The idea is that it's hepatoprotective in terms of withdrawal. So in that case, it may be something that can be used. But as a recommendation to give everybody metadoxin, well, the evidence isn't enough to say give it to everybody that you, who has withdrawn. But if you want to use metadoxin, it is something that is potentially hepatoprotective. And this may help in clients with more severe liver dysfunction. Dr. Bhogdeshwaran has a question. Thank you. And in COPD, can we use haloperidol as first line before benzodiazepine? Uh, it would be, ma'am, especially in COPD, we'd have to look at whether COPD itself may be worsening delirium. We'd have to look at the type of delirium that's occurring. What are all the factors there? For example, somebody may have an infection and that may actually be influencing delirium. In, even in this case, you would still use benzodiazepines, but you use a short acting benzodiazepine and you use it judiciously. You probably give it, uh, give smaller doses, observe and then plan to give more. Yeah, I think to add Why on, not haloperidol? Yeah, yes, I think, correct, ma'am. Antipsychotics, as a uh, concern with haloperidol is that decrease in seizure threshold and you can throw a seizure. 
but I, i think you can also use something like olanzapine or quetiapine low dose see all antipsychotic can ha can control uteral symptoms to an extent unless it is a complicated uteral so i think we have better agents nowadays like quetiapine olanzapine low dose can be used for uh, uteral symptoms but it's cautiously but saying all these things benzodiazepine is still the first line of drug probably low low benzodiazepine with addition of here and there will work best and especially in an icu setting the possibility is that delirium is not being caused so much by alcohol withdrawal as by other conditions and in that case yes antipsychotic <coughs> would be something that would be more effective than a benzodiazepine because if delirium is being caused by another condition say in the absence of autonomic signs person is in delirium then giving benzodiazepine may just worsen confusion in one point of time are using haloperidol is considered as Yes. Dr. Bhuvneshwar asks, is there a role of topiramate in acute withdrawal? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Um, not in terms of acute withdrawal per se, though in terms of the, the way it acts, possibly, I mean, but in terms of studies as such, there's no use of topiramate in acute withdrawal. Uh, Valparate has been tried. Again, but CUB has been probably as better evidence, at least overall in terms of is efficacy dr saurav das has a question he is asking what is the reference for one unit of alcohol converts to 1 mg of lorazepam there are two you could think of one is the uh, kaplan and sadox uh, comprehensive textbook of psychiatry has a pretty decent table and that could be one thing you refer the other one is goodman and gilman uh, goodman and gilman uh, says basically 1 mg of lorazepam is one unit and 5 mg of diazepam uh, some of the others tend to be a little bit very nitrazone for example is notoriously shifts from book to book so too chlorodiazepoxide but it's of no much use for our setting because there's no standardized alcohol yeah, in yes. yes i think also that sort of it's actually it's going on for years and years together i some some people have to change it but i think at the bottom line is the clinical symptoms determines your benzodiazepine usage i think we should slowly change this concept of one unit and we not only here we also follow very you know very strictly religiously one unit is one uh, what you call one lorazepam which is not right by any means and at this point of time having so much nice instruments available easy to access the uh, withdrawal symptom one should not uh, 